I am very pleased to welcome you all today to this discussion on, on the deaths of despair and the future of capitalism and, and to welcome our, our honored guests, uh, Anne Case and Angus Deaton. Um, I'm going to say just a very few words about them and about the, 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 discussions, uh, the, the, the discussions that we have uh, who are, who are going to, I guess they're interlocutors, I guess is the way you put it, if you're somewhere else. Um, okay, so Aunt, uh, Professor Anne Case is the Alexandra Stewart 1886 Professor of Economics and Public Affairs. I had to look at that twice when I sort of wrote down 1886. Um, um, she, she is the Arrow Award winner for work linking uh, the, on, on the, the origins of the gradient in, in, uh, in uh, uh, health status and economic status in, in early childhood. In fact, I teach her, her work in my health economics class, and, I, and I, uh, uh, it's influenced a lot of my thinking. Uh, she, she won the Coselli Prize from, for, from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences for research in midlife mobility and mortality. Uh, she has a long list of honors. I'm just going to list a few of them. She's a fellow of the National Academy of Medicine, American Phil Philosophical Society, the uh, fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She serves on the President's Committee on National Medal of Science uh, and on the Committee on, the Na of, on National Statistics. She has uh, led an incredibly distinguished career, and uh, I, I personally have learned a, a lot about health inequality from her work. Uh, uh, Sir Angus Deaton is the is and this is this is fantastic because uh, it, Stanford doesn't name its professorships in, this, in, in exactly this way. He was the Dwight D Eisenhower Professor of Economics and International Affairs uh, and emeritus, I guess. Uh, he is uh, at the Woodrow Wilson School in the Economics Department of Princeton. Uh, his, uh, he won the 2015 Nobel Prize in Economics on the analysis and consumption of poverty and welfare. Uh, I first encountered his work uh, uh, on a book that he wrote with, uh, with, with a, uh, called The Economics of Consumer Behavior. And that, that also, in grad school, transformed the way I think about uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of things. Um, he, the, uh, the, the, the book previous to this one he, that, he, that he published is called The Great Escape, Health, Wealth, it, uh, and the Origins of Inequality. Uh, where he extols many of the virtues of capitalism, but also, uh, but uh, and, and I guess this is the we get to, we get to hear the downsides. Um, discussing uh, this this work with them today will be uh, Professor Dan Winkler from from Harvard. He, Dan Dan is the Mary B. Saltonstall Professor of Population of Ethics. Um, he at the, at the Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health. Uh, he is. Uh, also, it's uh, impossible to summarize the the, uh, the the work that he's done uh, in, in, in very very succinctly. But he but he's uh, he's the, for instance he's the author of of a, of a book called Chance to Choice: Genetics and Justice. Uh, he he's he's worked extensively on um, on uh, issues of ethics in in medicine, and he uh, he he's the uh, um, it, it's it's it, it well maybe you'll get a chance to hear from him. L last night at dinner, we heard about uh, his father Abraham Winkler. Who was, a, who was a pioneer in the research on addiction, addiction disorders, and in particular on conditioning and relapse. Um, and he has some very, very colorful stories to tell if, he, if, you, if you guys can get him to, get him to tell them. OK. Uh, and then finally, we have uh, Professor Anna Lemke, who is the Associate Professor of Psycho Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences here at Stanford. She is the Medical Director of Addiction, Addiction Medicine. She is the Program Director of Stanford Addiction Medicine Fellowship. She is the Chief of Staff of Addiction, uh, of, um, in, uh, Addiction Med and Medical Dual Diagnosis Clinic. Uh, and she is the author of Drug Dealer MD, How Doctors Were Duped, Patients Got Hooked, and Why It's So Hard to Stop. Um, so it's like the perfect person for, the, for this discussion, I think. Um, and she, she's a, a fellow MD from Stanford as well. So, uh, um, uh, so let's join uh, in welcoming all, all four of us, and I'm looking forward to a good discussion. Well, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, I wanted to thank Anne and Angus for inviting me. I want to thank the Tanner Lecture Series uh, for inviting me. I want to thank the McCoy Family Center on Ethics. Um, in asking me to speak today, you really um, honor me and my work, unless, of course, it was a height requirement. Um, I, I want to say also, um, just kind of echoing some of the things that President Tessier Levine and Deborah Satt said um, in the two previous nights, that it's so important and wonderful that we have um, a space dedicated to discussing human values because it's so important. I also want to say that um, I am really personally inspired by Anne Case and her work. And I think it's marvelous that especially in this um, very controversial era of 
women economists and the, uh, the discussion about their work being recognized. I'm, I'm very happy that I can um, be inspired by her work being recognized in this forum. Okay, so today um, I'm going to make comments on um, the, this astounding piece of work that I was lucky enough to have an advanced reading of. Um, and my comments will be um, in response to what I have read and also uh, the, the, the many times I've um, heard Anne and Angus speak um, in person and also in other forums. Um, I should say that um, I do have a disclosure. I've been retained as an expert witness in the federal MDL litigation against opioid manufacturers, distributors, and other defendants based on uh, my book and my prior work on the origins of the opioid epidemic. Um, briefly, the overview of what I'd like to talk about today is first I want to talk very briefly about the power of language vis-a-vis um, -vis the deaths of despair. Um, then I want to ask the question, is this a problem unique to the less educated underclass, which is the point that Ann and Angus seem to be making, or is this a more universal phenomenon differentially affecting uh, the undereducated underclass? And um, the short answer, in my opinion, is that um, this is actually a universal phenomenon to which we are all vulnerable uh, that differentially affects uh, this subset of individuals that present with a certain phenotype that they try to capture. And I think it's important that they capture it. But I would say that um, it is my, my opinion uh, that we're dealing with something much more universal, uh, that this the undereducated underclass is the harbinger of what is more broadly affecting not just American society but developed nations and that America is just or the United States is just a first to manifest the signs and symptoms of a systemic disease. Uh, if so, then what might be that universal phenomenon and what to do about it? First, the power of language. So I want to just speak to this wonderful title, Deaths of Despair. Um, every once in a while, a title or a catchphrase comes along that captures the popular imagination in ways that are really profound. And I think Deaths of Despair does that. It's something that immediately resonates. It resonated for me. I know it resonates for others. Um, it seems to speak to something deeply true about what's happening uh, in American society. So I wanted to reflect on why is it that this title, Deaths of Despair, um, is so perfect uh, for this time. And I believe that it's because of the use of the term despair, a non-clinical, non-reductionistic, non-biological term. I am a psychiatrist. I was trained in medical school and through my residency uh, in the age of the brain. I learned a reductionistic approach to mental illness as uh, arising from aberrations in the chemical soup. I've been practicing psychiatry for almost 25 years, and I am now convinced that the chemical soup has very little to do with it, that really what we're dealing with is uh, ecological problems uh, to which people are variably vulnerable, a stress vulnerability diathesis. So I really uh, love deaths of despair. Um, but I want to talk about another way that they've used a, a kind of a lumping or a term that I don't think works as well, um, which is calling drug overdoses and alcoholic liver disease suicides. Let me explain why I don't think that that is um, qualitatively accurate. Um, I have practiced uh, psychiatry for a long time. And although it's certainly true that people with uh, the disease of addiction that leads to overdose and alcoholic liver disease uh, can become suicidal after many years of hopeless attempts to get into recovery um, and fail, failing to do so. Um, and it is true also that while intoxicated, uh, people can experience suicidal ideation that they don't experience uh, when they come out of it. I, I don't think fundamentally that people with addiction uh, want to die in the way that people who are depressed and suicidal want to die. I think these are different things. Um, so just an example, an anecdotally, I had a patient call me and say to me, I'm surrounded by empty bottles. I can't stop drinking, but I don't want to die. Will you help me? Um, so I, I, think, I think, again, th these phenomena are related, but it's somehow um, not accurate to, put, to, to state that they're all suicides. I, I think what, because if you were to do that, uh, I, I think there's a sense of 
uh, we attribute a sense of volitional uh, behavior to uh, addiction to drugs and alcohol that may not be entirely accurate once people are truly deep in their addiction. I also think that deaths of despair should include all problems of pathological overconsumption, including obesity, which leads to type 2 diabetes mellitus. And I don't think anybody would say that people who are obese are suicidal. So in that same sense, I would not say that people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol are suicidal. Um, okay, so let me try to capture then what I believe is the unifying problem affecting all of us that disproportionately and differentially affects uh, people who are uh, without a BA and people who are uh, living in poverty. I think the fundamental problem is a problem of pathological overconsumption. Uh, we are, in essence, uh, human beings are cacti in the rainforest. Let me explain. Human beings are evolutionarily designed to seek out pleasure and avoid pain, and we are remarkably adept at doing that, so much so that we have, in fact, transformed the world into one for which we are not evolutionarily adapted. Uh, I love the concept of the Anthropocene, this idea that's often used uh, for climate change to explain the way in which human behavior has changed the face of the planet. I think that we can apply that same concept uh, to this problem uh, that we're, that's manifesting as deaths of despair. We have changed our ecosystem through the remarkable success of capitalism to the point where we are killing ourselves. We are, in essence, awash in dopamine, dopamine being that pleasure neurotransmitter. In many different forms, we have increased access, increased potency, and increased consumption. So in essence, in essence I believe that deaths of despair are the result of pathological overconsumption due to increased access to high-potency pleasure goods, which I think could also include things like screens, uh, more disposable income to buy those goods, which I think somewhat challenges this notion of uh, income inequality as the core problem, uh, which is not actually what Case and Deaton say. They, they talk in a much more nuanced way about rent seeking. But this idea that somehow um, class and poverty explain this, um, more leisure time to consume uh, these pleasure goods, I think time is a really fundamental variable in this discussion of deaths of despair, and I'll talk about that. And then importantly, which is really what Case and Deaton are getting at more broadly, the lack of alternative sources of dopamine, or what Freud uh, referred to as love, work, and play. The question that I would ask is this, are deaths of despair really indeed the dark side of capitalism? You've all seen this graph uh, showing that as opioid prescribing has quadrupled over the last several decades, uh, so have opioid-related deaths. Um, I believe that the opioid epidemic is fundamentally and primarily a supply problem. People who have increased access to opioids are at higher risk to use them, become addicted to them, and die from them. Access to addictive substances are a fundamental risk related, uh, it is probably the, the primary risk for becoming addicted, at least in the modern society. We're now, of course, in the second wave of that epidemic where uh, deaths attributable to heroin and fentanyl um, now supersede deaths related to prescription opioids. But again, that's a natural transition from prescription opioids uh, to these uh, illicit substances. And potency plays a big role in this, in this uh, problem, again, as, as, as Anne and Angus have pointed out. And this is part of the innovation of technology. The fact that we have substances like fentanyl, that we can make them cheaply in illicit laboratories, that they're actively being made across China and imported into the United States in a kind of reverse opium wars is really a testament to technology, mechanization, globalization, and the vastly increased access to addictive substances. I'm going to go through very briefly a series of papers that I think um, are in support of this idea that although economic factors and individual factors play a role in deaths of despair, the primary role is exposure and consumption of these drugs. This is an article by Edlund et al. Look at the, looking at the odds ratio of developing an opioid use disorder uh, on prescription opioid medication. These are chronic pain patients. Finding that the number one 
most important risk for developing an opioid use disorder while receiving prescription opioids for chronic pain is not individual factors like co-occurring mental health disorders or even prior history of addiction. It's dose and duration of that substance. What drives prescription opioid abuse? Evidence from migration, a very cleverly done study, including uh, people here at Stanford, looking at if you take a Medicare uh, patient on SSDI and, wa and, and watch them move from a region of higher or lower opio prescription opioid misuse, how does that geographic change affect their risk of opioid misuse and addiction? And finding that whether or not there was prescription overprescribing in that region and prescription opioid misuse was a stronger predictor than individual factors of whether or not that individual would then engage in opioid misuse. Likewise, Christopher Room has done work in this area, and I can't really um, comment on uh, his math because that's not my area, but uh, ultimately he also concludes that uh, that really this is a drug exposure problem more than it is a problem of class or race or economics. Um, Anne, you and Lisa were discussing the, the racial differences in terms of uh, opioid misuse and addiction, and I think supply can explain those racial differences, um, namely that you know in the 1990s and early aughts, um, if you were white, you were more likely to have good health insurance. And if you were more likely to help have good health insurance, then good medical care meant that you were more likely to be prescribed opioids at higher and higher doses. So I think it's the endemic racism in our medical system that explains why a white people um, were, were more likely to be prescribed opioids than brown or black people of a similar economic class. We also know that there's incredible implicit bias in medicine, that doctors are less likely to prescribe opioids to black and brown people uh, because they believe those individuals are more likely to misuse them. I also think that supply can explain class differences when it comes to the opioid epidemic to some extent. There are data showing that people receiving Medicaid are prescribed opioid painkillers at twice the rate of non-Medicaid patients and die from prescription overdoses at six times the rate. And I have argued that we have essentially medicalized poverty. We do not have a social safety net. Medicine has become our social safety net. And when doctors encounter complex problems like unemployment, homelessness, multi-generational trauma in their patients, they are not given the tools to actually address those problems, so instead they biologize problems, which are not in fact biological, and then use a pill to solve that problem. The same thing that we are seeing with opioids can be seen uh, with cigarette consumption, which um, vastly increased uh, between 18, well, this is the, the graph showing uh, in the 1800s when the cigarette uh, manufacturer machine was invented, there was a sudden uptick in cigarette consumption. Why? Because of increased access. A wonderful book um, by um, Cross and Proctor show, called Packaged Pleasures, How Technology and Marketing Revolutionized Desire. Uh, show how the sudden uptick in cigarette consumption uh, correlates with the uh, cigarette rolling machine. Uh, it used to be that um, we could roll about four cigarettes per, min per minute, and now we roll about 20,000 cigarettes per minute. And although smoking cigarettes has gone down in North America, it's on the rise in the rest of the world. Uh, and in fact, uh, we are now have our new version of that. Um, again, um, fueled by capitalism and technology, the Juul, uh, one Juul cartridge is the equivalent of approximately one to two packs of cigarettes, uh, very popular among teenagers. Similar story with cannabis, uh, with the legalization of recreational cannabis, on the heels of medical marijuana, what we have now is easy access to very high potency cannabis. Uh, this was not true before. Average THC content and CBD levels is going up drastically in terms of cannabis. What was a weak drug is now a strong drug. Once you legalize drugs, it means that everybody will use more, but in particular, a vulnerable subset of the population will use much, much more. What we're seeing now is daily very heavy smokers in a subset of this population. And again, I think much of this is attributable to uh, and being fueled by this capitalist idea of just um, sort of uh, rent-seeking uh, through substances. 
And then, of course, there's uh, smartphones, which I, uh, I think are the equivalent of a modern-day hypodermic needle, uh, uh, basically uh, delivering digital dopamine for our wired generation. Uh, these devices are not just addictive in and of themselves, but they create access uh, to uh, these other substances, and they also create um, addictions that didn't exist before. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, disposable income. Um, I learned about this from what I think is a really remarkable book, The Fourth Great Awakening, by another Nobel Prize winning economist. I'm looking forward to putting your book uh, on my shelf next to this book. But this was really um, a revelation for me when I read this book. Um, Robert Fogel talks about how by the mid-1970s, not only the rich, but virtually everyone in the middle and many at the lower end of the income distribution owned a washing machine or had access to one. Our society is so well saturated with consumer durables, in fact, that even the poorest fifth of households are well endowed with them. To me, this is really, really important. Income inequality is important, but really what we're talking about is a class of individuals with tremendous access to drugs in part because of disposable income. I also think that time is a really important variable. Not only are we living longer, but we're working less. And if you look at the difference by education uh, in terms of leisure time, what is striking is that overall we work fewer hours than we did 100, 200 years ago. Uh, but if you have less than a BA, you have more leisure time than if you have a BA or greater. So again, I think this really plays into vulnerability. I think we're all struggling with the growing problem of boredom, uh, but I think that the undereducated underclass is more burdened with this problem uh, than people who have uh, meaningful work or let's say very lucrative work because in many ways what we have now is addiction incentives built into lucrative work uh, that has contributed to the growing problem of workaholism among people I think who are more highly educated. Also I want to speak briefly about how the nature of work has changed uh, through mechanization and technology, we are also more sedentary than we ever have been before. We are not moving our bodies. There's a kind of a mind-body duality. People are incredibly disconnected to their bodies. This comes out again clinically uh, in my work, seeing patients, how detached people are from their physical experience. I think that plays into increased consumption of these highly sensory substances, uh, like drugs and alcohol, uh, and also so in other ways in which we interface with screens. It's not also just um, blue collar jobs or jobs that are lower paying that are divorced from meaning. I would also argue that many jobs that we would traditionally think of as deeply meaningful um, have now become divorced from meaning. I will use medicine as the example. There's been a mass migration in medicine over the last 30 years. Uh, out of physician-owned practice into large integrated healthcare centers. Uh, physicians and other healthcare providers today are essentially uh, hospital factory workers. As a result, uh, we are um, obligated to practice in certain ways and according to certain protocols. Um, and some of the mandates include palliating pain, prescribing pills and performing procedures because that's what pays, protecting privacy and pleasing patients. Essentially, doctors have become waiters and patients have become our customers. As I said before, addictive incentives have been woven into this corporate structure. This just happens to be um, a plot of my revenue earning uh, graph that I receive monthly from my administration, which tells me whether or not I am meeting my targets. You can imagine that when that line is above the purple line, and I happen to choose one that's above to show you all, um, I get a little jolt of dopamine, and when it's below, I'm quite unhappy. Um, a couple of years ago, my uh, then 11-year-old son decided to Google my name on the internet, and he found uh, this and called me over and seemed alarmed. He said, Mom, um, is this you? And I looked at it, and it appears to be a doctor rating site. And you'll note at the bottom that uh, this patient gave me one out of four stars and had this to say about me. Uh, she'll make you wish, oh, I can't even read it from here. Let's see. Uh, she provides the kind of care that will make you wish you had never sought help in the first place. Wrong diagnosis, wrong medication. In some cases, this can be terrible. Seek help from someone else.
I was naturally mortified. I immediately began to click through in my brain who possibly else might have seen this. I mean, I had to admit to my son that, yes, that, that was me. This is really um, fundamental to this problem. I've gone all around the country in the past several years um, speaking to healthcare providers and urging them to prescribe more judiciously. And they'll say to me, Dr. Lemke, I'll prescribe fewer opioids when you can promise me I'll still get good scores on my patient rating satisfaction surveys. How we do on these surveys in medicine is directly tied to our professional advancement and directly tied to our salaries. And you can imagine how that impacts our prescribing habits. Now, the good, there also, by the way, is no evidence to show that patients who rate their doctors more highly have better health outcomes. There is evidence to show that they're more likely to go back to that doctor, but not that they're necessarily going to get better. And there are some data showing that individuals who rate their doctors more highly are more likely to use prescription drugs and to die earlier even when controlling for comorbidity. Now, the good news is for me is that my son did come back in a few minutes later and he said, don't worry, Mom, I just gave you four out of four stars. <laughs> Twice. I also think, and, and uh, Anne and Angus, you talk about this in myriad ways, but I think it's worth pointing out that cultural narratives have also played a role here. We had an interesting question on the first night. What is it about the 1970s? Why this transition? And of course, you talked about stagnating wages and other reasons why that was a pivotal uh, turning point. But I think there's something also going on culturally that we have now developed over many decades, starting about in the 1960s and 70s, narratives that promote consumption as the highest good. I will just share with you a patient who I'm currently treating, brought in by distressed parents, a 21-year-old male, who explained to me his life philosophy as follows. I do whatever I want, whenever I want. If I want to stay in my bed, I stay in my bed. If I want to play video games, I play video games. If I want to snort a line of coke, I snort a line of coke. If I want to have sex, I go online and find someone and meet them and have sex. Very distressing life philosophy. It's not working particularly well for him, but he's not really inclined to change it. And I'm struck by the normalization of this hedonistic approach. As I've written about before, we're also culturally in a time when we have no tolerance for pain, when pain has become anathema. Uh, we believe that, in fact, the experience of pain in, ever, in any form, whether physical or emotional, can leave a kind of psychic scar which sets people up for vulnerability for future pain, for example, in the form of post-traumatic stress disorder. Whatever you may think of the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, what's interesting to note is that it's a very modern concept. 150 years ago, people, including physicians, believed that pain was salutary, that it boosted the immune response, that what doesn't kill you uh, makes you stronger. Now it has become the obligation of healthcare providers of all ilk to eliminate all pain immediately lest they make that individual vulnerable to suffer future pain. Furthermore, patients expect that we will eliminate their pain. Along with this is the cultural narrative, if, if I am sad, I am sick, the kind of pathologization of everyday life, which I think has contributed to this problem. And I really do wonder if it's a legacy of the 1960s. And you talked about how this is not the baby boomers, it's the children of the baby boomers, which I think is fascinating. So in short, I do believe that deaths of despair is the phenomenon of us titillating ourselves to death. Um, yesterday, Deborah Satt said, I had this wonderful quote from Dante's Inferno, which I had never heard before. Um, she said, uh, quoting Dante, without hope, we live in desire. I think a way to rework this quote for the modern age, when we live in desire, we are without hope. How to move forward. Um, I would think that some of the important things that we need to do as a culture and a society to move forward are actually to decrease access to high potency pleasure goods, um, that we need to have less and not more disposable income to buy these goods, uh, that we need less leisure time to consume them. I'm very skeptical of the idea of a universal income. I think a universal income might be the very worst thing that happens to people, especially people who have less than a BA, which has been the focus of our talks. And of course, we need alternative sources of dopamine, much harder to achieve. I just want to remind everybody, uh, in case you didn't know, that public policy initiatives like prohibition, uh, which banned the uh, sale and possession and consumption of alcohol, uh, worked 
So there was a remarkable decrease in alcohol consumption in alcoholic uh, liver-related uh, uh, cirrhosis, decreased by 50%. Yes, there were unintended consequences of prohibition, but uh, in terms of this outcome, it did work. Uh, will we be able to do something like prohibition today? Not likely. Uh, so more likely than not, although public policy efforts will be important, including restricting opioid prescribing, um, we are going to have to come up with self-binding strategies in a world that's really overloaded with dopamine. Meaningful work, that's going to be very important. I just found this cartoon and I love it. I'm laying bricks versus I'm building a cathedral. I am really excited about the green movement. And the reason I'm excited about this movement is not just because uh, it may save our planet, but because it has the possibility to give young people a sense of meaning and purpose in a new age of restraint and denial that will allow them to feel that their suffering is worth something. Thank you. That was just wonderful, if I may say, editorialized. Really enjoyed it so, so very much. So um, uh, let me just get something out of the way first. Um, I'm delighted to be here, uh, and I'm, I, I probably don't need to repeat the, the thank yous and the hosannas. Uh, it's, it's an enormous honor to be commenting on papers by two eminent uh, economists whose work all of us admire so much. And I, too, am very grateful to the McCoy Family Center and to Stanford. And um, I'm very pleased to be here and look forward to discussing these issues with you. Now, um, let me first mention my very, very weird origins. <coughs> um, on occasion, when I'm asked to introduce myself, um, I say the following. Um, I was raised by Chinese opium addicts on a Kentucky prison farm on whom my father performed experiments for the CIA's mind control program. That's all true. <laughs> uh, now, how could that be? Well, maybe after, the, after uh, noon. We can go into that. But anyway, that is, that is so it all began at this place. Um, this, the, the federal government built a a large um, penitentiary in the bluegrass region of Kentucky. Um, the first res people in there were the Southerners who were abusing opiates like laudanum. Uh, but after a while, they were replaced by hipsters and other relative uh, outsiders from the fringes of uh, urban society, mostly in uh, the big cities, uh, supplemented by others. Um, my dad was the deputy director of the uh, Addiction Research Center, which is one of the precursors to NIDA. And um, a lot of the early work on the mechanisms of addiction um, uh, and uh, in general on, on psychopharmacology was actually done in, in the labs at this place. And I, uh, we lived on the grounds, and I grew up there. Why was I raised by Chinese opium smokers? <laughs> because um, some of the Chinese who emigrated to the United States brought with them the tradition of opium smoking, and it was illegal in the United States. When, when the feds arrested them, they, the offenders were sent here. And why did they raise me? Well, every prisoner had to have a job, and the jobs that were most desirable were to work in the households of the medical staff. And um, the, the doctors got their, got their choice of which prisoners uh, t would work there, and uh, of all the people who were in the Lexington prison, the one they liked the most were the Chinese, because the Chinese were ordinary people with jobs and families and children, whereas the blacks and the whites tended to be hipsters or other people on the fringes of society, and so the doctors felt fine about having the Chinese opium addicts um, t raise their children. Um, they had some concerns about the others, so that's that's a short end of <laughs> That's the story. So I did come from there, okay, um, and I just thought I'd share this wonderfully optimistic poster with you. This was created about the time that the Lexington um, uh, narcotic farm was created, and as you can see, relief is nigh. <laughs> we're still waiting. Uh, we always think we're just about there. 
Um, there's a documentary on uh, called The Narcotic Farm, as we, and, uh, and actually this, the, this, this is the cover of a book, as you can see. Um, and if you're curious about all this, uh, the documentary is on YouTube now. It was, it was on PBS a few years ago. Um, there's a brief picture of me as a three-year-old <laughs> in it. Okay, so enough of that. Um, uh, what it meant was that when, as I read the, uh, the book, this wonderful book uh, that we're commenting on, uh, there were parts that had enormous resonance for me uh, just because of this crazy background. Um, but it, that didn't give me any particular expertise. It just meant, meant that I was going to be absolutely riveted. So um, uh, uh, I, I will say, though, just to try to tie that into the commentary a little bit, that uh, the or my strange origins um, did augment the the um, impact of this powerfully, um, deeply sympathetic book that uh, directs our attention to the plight of a huge swath of the American population that's often perceived only through stereotypes and whose stresses and dire straits, if noticed at all, are often blamed on their own personal failings. And I'll, I'll say more about this in just a moment. Um, I'm the only uh, ethicist or philosopher on this panel, and this is we're sponsored by the McCoy Family Center for Ethics and Society. So I, I gather that my job as a commentator is to um, raise some questions about values, which is fine because values, um, most emphatically, according to the authors, lie at the heart of um, this book. Um, and like Vic last night, I, I, my, the remarks that come are not meant as opposition, because uh, I mostly share these values, but uh, as an attempt to suggest some points on which uh, further elaboration could strengthen the, the uh, value of this book. So I'm going to raise three relatively minor points, and they're not minor, they're major, but um, they're, relatively speaking, uh, points of detail. Um, just to point them out and say that maybe a few words on each of them might be apposite uh, in the next draft. And then I'll uh, raise a more substantive question as the fourth and last point. So the first one is this question of responsibility, personal responsibility. The thing about the deaths of despair is that they are self-inflicted in some sense. Um, I guess the obvious sense. Um, people die at their own hand. Um, now, in the American context, this prompts us to ask uh, where responsibility for these deaths should be assigned and where there's uh, suffering rather than death, similarly the question about who's responsible for the suffering. Uh, Anne and Angus uh, mention American individualism in partial explanation of why the safety net in the United States is so meager uh, compared to what goes on in pure countries. Uh, they explained this American individualism as, quote, the belief that people should not depend on others even when they're in trouble, unquote. It seems that's pretty good. Uh, but it's a, it's a more complicated doctrine. Uh, they, they, well, their book is not the occasion for a long analysis of it. Um, but it has other clauses and implications in particular. Uh, it seems to mean that if someone comes to grief as a result of foolish choices, they're not entitled to make a claim on others for help, although they may receive it as an act of charity. And this is all the more true when the choices that they've made and that have caused them such grief reflect badly on their moral character. And deaths of despair are cases in point. Drunkenness and drug abuse are highly stigmatized. And suicide, although no longer viewed solely or even mainly as a sin, is still disguised as a cause of death when the family and others say what, uh, something about the, uh, the deceased. The notion of personal responsibility for health uh, has a long and varied history in U.S. health policy. John Knowles of uh, the Rockefeller uh, Foundation wrote a much noted article in 1977 called The Responsibility of the Individual, and he proposed replacing the idea of a right to health with that of a duty to avoid overburdening the health system. So <laughs> it's sort of the, the converse, I guess. Uh, and we see this idea uh, bubbling up again in some of the requirements being placed on Medicaid recipients in some states. Uh, a lot of this began with the state of West Virginia, which had a personal responsibility contract that called on various acts on the part of the recipients in order to, um, to um, be eligible. Um, I one time, at one point, um, convened a, a small meeting on this and 
was trying to figure out where this came from, and I think it actually began with a consulting firm that Newt Gingrich had put together when he was out of office one time. Um, and uh, the expert use of the responsibility card is how the tobacco industry avoided destruction financially through litigation for decades uh, up until the, the uh, documentation of the effects of secondhand smoke where the uh, responsibility card no longer worked. Um, my own view is that the uh, question of how we assign responsibility for bad health outcomes has been underanalyzed, and uh, that's why I teach a course every year at the Harvard School of Public Health on that exact topic. Uh, it's a course about health promotion and uh, um, priority setting and related topics. The logic of this notion of responsibility uh, for health, I think, is rather cloddy. Um, people have some very strange ideas about it. Just let me share one anecdote. Many years ago, um, there was a bioethics commission at the presidential level. And to, to date myself, this was President Carter we're talking about. Um, and uh, uh, one of the reports that the, this commission was supposed to put out was um, a, um, what turned out to be a three-volume study of patterns of access to healthcare in America. And to my surprise, I was invited one day uh, to come to Washington and serve as staff philosopher. So I had, I was the only person in Washington with a business card that had the presidential seal in one corner and then the name and then a little staff philosopher on it. People thought it was a joke. Um, so uh, when, they, when I told them, no, this is real, and I told them what I was working on, they said, oh, good. I'm glad we have you uh, doing what you do because you're going to explain how American individualism Explain, uh, accounts for why Americans don't like collective solutions to, or collectivist solutions to uh, problems of health care delivery. I heard that from a lot of people. Now, what struck me as strange about it was that um, Americans love Medicare. And uh, that's one of those collectivist solutions. So I thought, you know, it's a funny country where Americans have sort of built into their moral fiber uh, from birth this antipathy toward collectivist solutions, and then on the night of their 65th birthday, everything changes, and they all become socialists. Um, so that made me rather uh, suspicious that there was a, any simple-minded notion of individualism out there that, that provided a philosophy that could be consistently applied. I wondered what else might be involved. Um, now, uh, this book doesn't have to uh, um, go into any of that stuff. Um, but at the same time, um, the question of responsibility does figure somewhere in there. Now, it's, it's, not, it's not talked about in the book, except in passing. You would hope, perhaps, that the responsibility card wouldn't be played in the case of deaths of despair. Um, I mean, people are dying, for Christ's sake, so why talk about what, whose fault it is, uh, or especially if, we, if what we intend to do is to pin the fault on them, our response should be um, should come from pity or, or solidarity or sympathy, but I'm afraid this is taking too much for granted. Um, uh, many of you, I'm sure, have read this book, *Hillbilly Elegy* by J.D. Vance, which paints this picture of devastation in a family of Appalachian origin uh, that he grew up in, in uh, north of the of the uh, Mason-Dixon line. Um, and that book. Um, as, as heartrending as his stories are, is a victim-blaming book. And uh, Vance is talking about his own family here. Um, and it's gotten a huge readership and an appreciative one. He escaped all this, but it's, uh, uh, although he sympathizes with the people who didn't escape and who've fallen victim to the mayhem uh, that's taking everybody down, uh, it's pretty clear that they are there to be blamed for it. And what's saddest about all this, I think, is that so many of the victims accept this verdict. Um, and how that could be is a long story, which probably others are better uh, equipped to answer uh, or to tell. But uh, when the victims accept the story and accept the responsibility for themselves, um, perhaps this robs them of their capacity to protest and to resist. So. Um, you may think, uh, I'm speaking Ang uh, Angus and Anne here, you may think that um, this question of who's responsible for these self-inflicted wounds, is the answer is so obvious that it's not worth dwelling on, but for, I'm, I'm afraid that 
in the minds of a good number of readers. Um, if, if, they think, if they agree that the answer is obvious, it's not going to be the, right, the same answer that you come up with. Now, here's a second one, which is rather different. Uh, I want to um, uh, point out one question uh, that comes up in the context of their discussion of globalization. Um, uh, Anne and Angus acknowledge the role that globalization, in particular, um, the Chinese uh, inexpensive imports have had in undermining the economic base of the American working class. And they, they rightly point out that the same phenomenon has not led to the deaths of despair in our peer countries. So, it, and they are, of course, are, they're also flooded with Chinese imports. So we can't invoke globalization as an, the, the single unanswerable explanation of the patterns that uh, Anne and Angus have uh, shown us have prevailed in, uh, in the American working class. Okay, fine, I, no argument there, but, but I wonder if they might want to address even if briefly a different aspect of this issue. Uh, which is how to take the gains to the Chinese into account in reaching an overall judgment about these, exchange, uh, these uh, exchanges of benefits and risks. Um, I've been traveling in China for decades and um, watching the development of China even as an occasional visitor over this time has put me in awe. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's been said that the augmentation of human well-being uh, that's taken place just recently in China, as hundreds of millions of people have risen from poverty to the middle class, has been the greatest um, movement, the greatest um, collective benefit in the history of the human race, at least within such a short uh, period. And indeed, uh, for th that reason, but also because of the implications for economic and even military dominance, the rise in China of China may be the single most momentous development of our lifetime. Now, to the extent that our loss is their gain, and you know, we can have much argument about how much that extent is real, um, can we automatically say that um, uh, the losses are what matter? Because after all, there may be a multiplier effect here. Maybe that the loss of somebody's job in America provides employment for three or four people in China who then lift their, their families out of poverty and then with them, um, perhaps the, the families of the people who sell them things in the village because they have the money to spend. So uh, when jobs are lost to factories here, it's possible that more people are helped over there than are hurt here. Now, in, a, in an era of America first, the idea that we should try to factor in the benefits of the, to the Chinese before reaching overall judgments about the direction of affairs might seem unthinkable, certainly unsayable, outside of this room. Um, but um, what is the job of the economist, or for that matter, a philosopher? Um, do we have a national bias? Well, we're not supposed to, I think. Now, of course, um, the, the point being made by uh, Anne and Angus, which is that globalization need not entail deaths of despair, as shown by the fact that they haven't done so elsewhere, is the most important. But the moral calculus that I'm talking about here might be worth engaging, if only briefly, as, uh, as they proceed. Now, a third one, which I think is going to come as a bit of a surprise, I just want to mention the word tobacco. It happens to be my current preoccupation these days, so I think about tobacco whenever I think. But um, now, there's not much about tobacco in this book. Um, I don't want to propose how it should figure in, but I want to raise the question of why it's not there. And um, that leads to some themes, I think, that um, Anna uh, also raised. I'll, I'll come, uh, try to explain that. Now, the, the, deaths, the number of deaths per year from tobacco, um, which is even now about 460 uh, or more, uh, 460,000 per year in the United States, that's not so different from the 600,000 deaths of despair that Anne and Angus have um, uncovered. Uh, and it's larger than their components. So that's pretty big. And uh, the tobacco deaths have some commonalities with these deaths of despair, deaths of despair um, de uh, uh, fatalities. Uh, for one thing, it's self-inflicted, as they are. And smoking uh, furnishes a pipeline from household budgets of the working class into corporate treasuries. 
where a lot of it is recirculated to Republican politicians and to a maze of organizations that present themselves as think tanks but are in fact public relations exercises and disinformation. And this is a circuit of funds that kills and impoverishes the working class whose victims in turn act as allies in defending it. And this story, I think, again, mirrors the, the, some of the stories that are told in other connections in this book. So maybe all that's needed is just a short explanation of why you're not talking about tobacco, but it also might be an uh, opportunity to address a question that I think hovers over this uh, discussion. This is one that Anna alluded to, which is um, exactly what this notion of despair amounts to and, and, and um, how it figures in these causal explanations of the excess mortality that, um, that we've been introduced to in such a um, forceful way. So what makes a choice an example of despair? Um, so we, this question comes up when we think, as Anna pointed out, when we think of these uh, accidental drug overdoses where the deceased uh, probably thought he or she was just trying to get high rather than committing suicide. Some people get high by shooting up drugs and other people go to the Metropolitan Opera, which fortunately is dangerous only to your budget. So how do we know when to invoke despair? Is a smoker despairing? Um, is someone who overeats, myself included, um, despairing? And why isn't smoking or overeating, for that matter, classed alongside alcohol and drug use? Uh, in the case of smoking, it's certainly more lethal in terms of half the people who do it die from it if they keep it up. And it's hard to find that kind of lethality in almost any other product that Americans die from in large numbers. So I come finally to my last point, which is um, the one that, where I think there is a possibility of substantive um, disagreement, although I don't have a position, so that's kind of hard to, uh, to prove, but uh, the, I, if I had one, it might be different from yours. <laughs> so uh, this is the, the notion of unfairness as a cause. Um, as a philosopher, ethicist, as I read this wonderful book, uh, I saw at several points a quite insistent emphasis uh, on a thesis that what's causing all this mayhem, it's not globalization, it's not inequality, uh, it's not poverty, it's unfairness. Unfairness is what the cause is. Okay, now I thought, look, I'm in the philosophy business, this is great. We're colonizing economics. You know, here's, here's a you know, philosophical idea, and it's being used as, a, as a, the key element in a causal explanation by two of the world's greatest economists. This is, you know, we've made it. Uh, but, of course, it raises some questions. <laughs> we want to know exactly how this works out. You know, how, what's the causal sequence exactly, and how does the unfairness get in there? And, all right, so that's one question. You know, just can, what is the model of causality, of chain of causes here, in which the unfairness is what causes it, causes the deaths? Um, now, the, but the second question too, which is, what is the theory or standard of fairness and unfairness that's being used here? So something's unfair, and the unfairness of it is what's causing these six hundred thousand excess deaths per year in the American working class. So I've been puzzling over these questions since I read the book, and uh, maybe I should have devoted my whole commentary to them, but I think as a commentator, it's just better for me to flag the questions rather than to try to work out an answer. Now, uh, Ann and Angus might respond by saying there's no real mystery here, it just seems to be, it's just a philosopher making trouble. Uh, American workers are suffering and they're dying as their counterparts in pure countries are not, even though the latter are facing many of the same dangers because the US hasn't protected them. Indeed, both corporations and now the government, which is increasingly their ally, if not their agent, are joining in the looting. That's self-evidently unfair, and it's what we should point to as causes of despair. So what's the problem? Well, uh, maybe there isn't, maybe that's, maybe that's enough of an answer, but uh, maybe not. So one problem is that uh, rent-seeking and also reverse Robin Hood plundering and so on didn't begin in 1970, as Vic reminded us last night. It's been going on for quite a long time, and it's not restricted to the United States. The big difference is that in times of slower growth, 
um, these practices inflict pain. Winners are taking well-being from losers in a zero-sum game. And that's, this is a great tragedy when this kind of plundering and um, rent-seeking is, is a, a possibility for the haves when the fight over a, a pie that's not getting any bigger. OK, um, but we can still ask the question, back before growth slowed, when it was 2.5%, um, the workings of the economy were throwing out benefits, profits, and they were being allocated in some process, some way or another. Was the division of these benefits fair all this time? Because it's a really important question. I mean, the unfairness of all this reverse Robin Hood stuff is what's the causal explanation of the excess deaths. So how about before 1970? Was that fair? Um, even if people were doing a bit better and there were many fewer deaths of despair, we can still raise this question. Now, what is the standard of fairness? Well, Marxists saw exploitation as the absolutely normal uh, uh, process that occurs in capitalism. It's part of the, one of the anchors of their theory, although Marxists uh, tended to, uh, to uh, refuse to talk about this in moral terms. Uh, presumably, Ann and Angus don't um, think that um, in the ordinary workings of capitalism, uh, let's say U.S. pre-1970, you know, during the boom years, when all that money was coming out of the system, um, they don't think that people were being exploited. Uh, I don't know, but maybe they can answer. Okay, uh, if, if so, uh, what, when does it become exploitative? Um, and what is an exploitative um, division of the, uh, the, uh, of the benefits of, of uh, commerce and, and manufacturing and so on? Um, and uh, uh, if, if they think it's um, non-exploitative, okay, but you know, what would be exploitative then? And when does unequal sharing of benefits become unfair? And I wondered, do Ann and, and, uh, are, and um, Angus have an implicit theory of justice, um, you know, a recipe for what would constitute fairness on a grand scale? Um, I don't think it's consequentialist um, or utilitarian. And the reason I think that is that in their analysis, the fact that people are dying means it's wrong. So the, the, the sharing pattern can be condemned because of all those deaths. Now, if you're a consistent um, utilitarian, you wouldn't say that. You, there aren't any trumps for utilitarians. You just ask, well, what are you getting in exchange? Um, and they're certainly not Rawlsians, uh, because uh, Rawls was very, very uncomfortable with, um, with um, uh, prosperity on the part of people uh, who were well-placed, um, unless their prosperity was essential for increasing the share of the smallest uh, uh, holdings of the people in that society. And um, I think it's pretty plain in the book, please correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, Ann and Angus are not bothered by great wealth as long as it's uh, obtained without hurting other people. So inequality is not what really is bad. What's bad is hurting people uh, on the short end of the stick. So maybe, maybe the best way to describe the implicit theory, as far as I could um, figure out what it was, is um, a kind of in egalitarian contractualism, where we as a society must agree. Uh, we, we, like the, we like the growth engine that capitalism is. But we don't like it if it starts killing people. And um, so the, the principle is uh, something like do no harm. But if that's what it is, I, I wonder, is there a whiff of circularity here? Because um, uh, we have the thesis that what causes the deaths, these excess deaths, uh, is unfairness. OK, well, what's unfairness? Well, the division of benefits becomes unfair if it causes deaths. Um, should we be worried? I'm not sure. Well, I think I've uh, used up my time. Uh, if I had another moment, which I don't, <laughs> I would then throw all caution aside and uh, pretend to be a political scientist.
uh, I think there's, there's a big story that is not in the last part of the book, uh, but I think uh, the book would be bolstered if it were there, and that's uh, the, basically it's the, uh, an account of the rise of the, of the far right in American politics, which we can date back to the reaction to the New Deal. And um, it's one that has been chronicled now in a series of, of rather alarming and fascinating books by historians. Um, that uh, mostly a question of infiltrating the Republican, Republican Party, which used to have a lot of quite moderate people, and some of us may remember. Um, and it started back in the 30s under Roosevelt. Um, it was regarded as fringy, uh, up to Goldwater, and then got ahead of steam even though he was disastrously defeated, and um, culminated in the takeover of the, the 2016 trifecta, which wasn't just a victory by the Republican Party, but by the far right wing of the Republican Party. Um, in my own view, the key figure is not Trump, who's just an aberration, but um, uh, McConnell. And I don't think it's a accident that he comes from a tobacco state, namely, same one that I do. I, I know that type. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the part of the story is their mastery, just amazing mastery of the message, the informational part, where they, they managed to, to um, create a virtual monopoly over the source of information in Fox News and to dismantle, systematically dismantle, one by one, um, every protective agency, every process that had been erected um, to um, uh, stay the ravages of overbearing uh, American capitalism. And they, they do it in a way that, um, I mean, going from all the way from the Civil Rights Commission to the Consumer Finance Protection, Financial Protection Bureau, and above all, to, to open, but paint a smiley face on it at all times so that no one's alerted to what's going on. So I'll just conclude on a happy note. Um, the only silver lining to the current dominance of the far right movement within the Republican Party is that the 2016 vote refocused our attention on the sufferings of the working class, those to whom the Democratic Party once pledged its, uh, its uh, troth, its, its, its uh, mission. Um, and I'll just conclude by saying that this deeply compassionate book offers help in rededicating ourselves to this mission and explains why we must. Thank you. Um, we don't have this. We just have the two lectures followed by discussants. And so this is a rather strange beast um, as far as I'm concerned, and I didn't know what to expect. And this has just been wonderful. I mean, it, it's great to have the two discussants have a real amount of time and develop arguments. And boy, did they develop um, some arguments. So um, I think there's several things. Um, obviously, Anne and I have not had the time to consult yet. But it's clear that several things um, are going to get changed um, in the book. And for that, we're just eternally um, grateful. Um, and uh, I think on, on both sets of comments that, uh, you know, not everything I would 100% agree with. But there are things that really I, I and Anne have thought about pretty hard. But I think um, this is probably really changed her mind to some extent. So just uh, going through one or two of the notes here, I think, which are perhaps um, worth um, talking about. Um, on Anna's um, comments, I think um, this power of language I, I really go along with. Um, and I think the, the one thing we really will talk about much more carefully is this um, you know, I think in the book we say, in some sense, these are all suicides. Um, and that's a very weaselly statement. So I think we have to be much clearer about to what extent they're self-inflicted and to what extent they're not self-inflicted. And they clearly are very different. Um, while there's still a commonality there that we want to talk about. Um, we thought about including um, obesity, type 2 diabetes deaths, and so on. Um, the problem with that is that once you, you know, we've got a fairly sharp thing where we are, and if we extend it too far, 
we were worried that we would lose the sharpness. So we really thought about that hard, but and maybe we should have done it, but um, it, we, we really have not um, gone um, that way. But I hope we can use this quote about, I'm surrounded by bottles, um, I can't stop drinking, and I don't want to die, because that strikes me as exactly the right thing to say. And it's a quote that um, captures something that's really very, very important and that's not in our book um, right now. So I think we would really, um, really move on that. Um, it relates also <laughs> to, um, Anne and I spent a lot of time, not as much as we used to at the Metropolitan Opera. Um, we don't think of ourselves as on the ver verge of deaths of despair. Uh, we're listening to the opera. It might be deaths of something else, but it, it's true that you're sort of feeding the beast in some sense, and we're just feeding the beast. And I think that is actually a very important distinction between rich people and less rich people. That um, you know, one of the things that education brings you is um, ways of being able to soothe the beast that are less destructive um, than um, you know, alcohol, um, tobacco. Um, or, or drugs. Um, it's something that economists have to, there was a, um, a set of papers about 25, 30 years ago about that, which is that one of the distinctions between people who are wealthy and people who are not wealthy is that poor people by and large only have their bodies. They have very little else. They do what economists call um, human capital, meaning education and so on. They have relatively little of that and so um, people who have to rely on their physical capital, their bodies essentially, they have to use that for both work, so they do heavy manual work, which can be destructive, um, as opposed to sitting behind a desk, which is destructive too, but not in the same way. Um, and also, if to get pleasures, um, you know, they have very little interest in going to the opera or maybe reading books or something like that, but there are other ways and that could be quite destructive um, of the body too. Um, I do want to say though that um, I agree with almost everything that Dan said. He may have left you with the impression that we endorse American individualism. I mean, we talk about it in the book as a possible cause of this thing, but it's not something that we actually endorse. Nor do we say that people are entirely, I mean, the responsibility issue is a very interesting one. I've talked with Dan about this before, um, and I'm not quite sure where he sit on this, but it's not, we're not endorsing American individualism. I think one of the things that explains the lack of a safety net in the U.S. that we talk about a little bit, and which hasn't really come up here, is race. Um, you know, the, the people who came, Witherspoon and the other people who came to Princeton and who um, trained up Madison and were the sort of fathers of the revolution came from the same place I came from. I mean, they came from Scotland. Um, if you look at what's in Scotland now, they've got an elaborate welfare state. We don't have an elaborate welfare state in America, and, the answer, and why not? And one of the answers that repeatedly comes up from the historians is race, that people don't want to construct insurance schemes with people that they see as very different from themselves. Um, and so this issue of race just keeps coming back in these social policy um, issues and I think are quite important. Let me, I'm gonna hand over to Anne, but I, I just wanted to say something in defense of capitalism, and this is where Anna and I really, I think, do disagree. You know, I don't know what's wrong with washing machines, right? You know, my mother um, used to get up every Monday at five o'clock in the morning um, to put coal under the boiler to start off her Monday washing cycle, which took from 6 a.m. until 5 p.m. when she took these frigid clothes off the Scottish washing line that weren't particularly dry at the end of an absolutely exhausting day. When my mother got a washing machine in, I think, about 1960, it completely changed her life, and it made her life hugely um, better. Um, and that comes to what Dan said, too, about the Chinese. Um, I think about this in a different way. One of the reasons I'm so pro-capitalism is, you know, the billion people that have been taken out of poverty um, in the last 30 years. And that would not have happened without the power of markets, without globalization. So don't fool yourself that there's some other way that that could have been engineered by the World Bank or the UN or something of the sort. Um, you know, directing the world to make it better. Um, those people got there because of 
you know, the power of the market in some sense. You know, a Chinese market is not like an American market, but nevertheless, without that, none of that really would have happened. And as Dan said, that is perhaps the greatest achievement in human history that something like two billion people were taken out of poverty over that period. And out of a poverty where, which was just grinding and awful and sort of impossible. Not like we think of um, poverty here. So that's a huge achievement. Um, so I don't, but I don't think that we're trading off um, Chinese lives for American lives or something. First of all, the China shop work has got huge publicity, but it's local. So, you know, just as the World Trade Organization opened things up, it made jobs in Seattle for people building Boeing airplanes, or at least it did for a while, um, just as it lost jobs in places that were competing with China. And there are many estimates which suggest that the net job loss to opening up in China was not really very large and may not have been, may even have been the other way around. You know, there might have been jobs gained. Um, but the issue here is, to me at least, we want these benefits of capitalism, you know, but we've got to control it because if it's not controlled, um, you know, we'll get the sort of crap that we're getting now. And we'll get the McConnells, <laughs> you know, and I very much agree with that, um, where the excesses are defended and the right of people um, to treat us as sort of, it, it's almost like they're farming us as, well, not us, but that a lot of people are being treated purely as fodder for this machine as opposed to having human dignity and responsibility um, of their own. Let me just say one last thing and I'll stop. Keep saying one last thing. Okay. <laughs> this really is the last thing. All right. You can, um, <laughs> I bought my mother again. <laughs> Always comes back to my mother. That's one of the things I learned in America. Um, that uh, my mother used to say, I hope you never get rich. Maybe I'll do a Scottish accent here. She said, I hope you'll never get rich. And I'd say, Mom, why do you hope I never get rich? She says, because if you get rich, you'll become an alcoholic. Everybody I know who has money is an alcoholic. Well, that's the Anna Lemke theory yes. of what it does. And I'm not. OK. <laughs> Thank you both so much. This is enormously helpful. And for us with the book, it comes at exactly the right time because we're going to spend from now until the end of August <laughs> revising. Oh, gosh, I'm really on it. Um, and this is just really important changes to be made to the book that I think will make it much stronger. I'm, I just want to pick on, I think, on one point each, just so that we have time to open it up. Um, with Anna, I, you know, I, I think it would be great for us to have a longer conversation on the extent to which this is a supply problem. I mean, before there was Oxycontin, there was Vicodin, right? And, and at least in my reading of it, Vicodin was the second most prescribed drug in America for many years running. And yet this explosion of deaths caused by um, opioid addiction didn't take place. So it, it seems like there, there were uh, drugs there prior to the arrival of OxyContin, but OxyContin seemed to, and indeed it is a supply problem in the sense that there was Sackler, there was this 800-person um, marketing force that targeted poor areas and less well-educated areas so that they, they could pick up sales more rapidly. So certainly that was there, but I think if if people had um, been well, it would not have um, taken hold quite as, uh, as much as it did. So um, Chris Room wanted to set up some weird dichotomy where we were all about the demand side and he was going to come in and explain the supply side. And we think that's really a false dichotomy that um, this is something that happened to people who are already showing signs of increased deaths from cirrhosis of the liver, suicides were already on the rise, and then boom, let's drop a match on a dry patch here and get Oxycontin going. So um, we certainly think that one of the taps that needs to be turned off is the overprescription of, of, of um, these heavy duty opioids, but we think that we'd be fooling ourselves to think that everything was going to be fine once we did that. Um, 
On the, um, the really important, and I think this is where a, a lot of time between us will be spent in reading and talking to people, is um, unfairness and what our theory of unfairness is. Um, I think in my head what I have is that it's a fuzzy um, area and that if you stay within the bounds, it seems to be fair, um, but that we have come outside of any bounds that anyone might think of as being fair. But I, uh, that, uh, that does not come from a deep um, um, reflection on that at this point, but hopefully by the time we get the book back to Princeton University Press, we will have dug into that in a, in a bigger way. I don't know if you want to talk about unfairness at all. Um, <laughs> I knew you would leave that to me. Um, well, I, I mean, I said what I thought, bounds. No, 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 I agree with that. Um, and I just, I need time to think about what Dan said, which is just really, really terrific. Yeah, um, yeah. Which is, uh, partly, I think this came from let, let me say a negative thing and then say that I don't think I have the answer. I mean, I agree with what you said about what we don't say. <laughs> um, partly, there's a view out there, and it actually said that on a version of this poster, um, which it doesn't say anymore. It says, come and see how inequality kills. And that inequality killing argument, which is very widespread, we think is really wrong. Um, and, you know, I wrote another book called The Great Escape, um, this part of the subtitle of which is, um, you know, The Origins of Inequality. And my argument there is that you can't get this enormously beneficial capitalist development without generating a lot of inequality along the way. And that inequality is actually a sign of good things happening much of the time, but somehow it gets out of hand. And it's the getting out of hand that we're bothered by. And, I think most people, when you pick them apart and when you look at a lot of the lab experiments that have been done about inequality, what really upsets them is not so much the inequality, it's the unfairness. And a lot of the experiments that you see in which people are upset. We saw, we saw a picture of the, who's the primatologist? Franz de Waal. Franz de Waal yeah, this has, has this experiment with two monkeys um, in a cage. And there's little holes in the cage, and there's an experimenter outside. And the monkeys have heaps of rocks um, in their cage, about hand-sized rocks, monkey hand-sized rocks. And the monkeys have to hand a rock out, and in exchange, the experimenter gives them a piece of fruit um, for the rock. No, and they've been feeding them cucumber. Cucumber Cucumber's yeah. a fruit. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> it's just not a very nice fruit. It's, right. Right. Which so is part of the story. The, this thing know. has been running along for a while, and the monkeys are taking rocks out, happy as clams, and getting pieces of cucumber back and munching on them, and all's happy. And then the experimenter gives the monkey on the right a grape instead of the cucumber, right? And <laughs> <laughs> the, the other one, ooh, 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 this is really nice, right? And the other one goes on eating the cucumber and looking over his shoulder. They're in perspex cages so they can see each other. And then the Next time around, another grape, another piece of cucumber, and he eats it sort of very slowly. And then the next time he gets a cucumber and the other one gets a grape, the monkey hurl starts hurling rocks at the experiment. And cucumber right and, back at And, and like, beating on the cage and trying to tear the whole world apart. Right? Now, that's not inequality. And, and Franz said, well, immediately after the word said, that's the effect of inequality. Right? I don't think it's the effect of inequality at all. It's just grossly unfair. Why the hell is he getting a grape while I'm getting this rotten cucumber and I'm going to hit it in your face? And I think what's going on in our society a lot of the time is just organized theft. And, you know, I think rather than me say it, Dan said it, you know, organized theft organized by Mr. McConnell. But again, but organized theft, is, as Dan said, was happening before 1970, right? But the pie was bigger, and everybody was getting something. Actually, I, don't, I disagree with you there. Yeah. I think this lobby, the rent-seeking really did start in 1970. You know, when, when Ralph Nader went after General Motors in 1970, there was not a single General Motors lobbyist in Washington. There were no lobbyists in Washington. There were trade associations that basically reported back. So the whole modern lobbying industry which is sort of slowly strangling 
and corrupting our government really started in 1970. And I think it's a response to the slowing growth, or that's one of the causes of it. I mean, I think the Nixon, you know, all the stuff that went on around that time geared it up. But I think it's a modern phenomenon. And that's what most people don't understand, that, that lobbying, the modern lobbying industry that we really see is a post-1970 creature. Yeah, but that doesn't make the Treaty of Detroit fair, no, no, I right? I agree with that. I mean, I'm trying so... to avoid the hard questions. You, you answer that <laughs>